Good evening, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. It's something slightly different tonight. We are piloting a new series, potentially, and it was not my idea. I will give credit to Jules Anorak on Twitter, who come up with this and then told me, unfortunately, he couldn't be involved in the first episode. But it is going to be called Jules in the Pub or not. But the idea is for me and a couple of fans to sit around on a monthly basis or so and have a chat about everything that has been going on around the football club in the last month or so. And I'm pleased to say for the first episode, I'm joined by Jack and by Reese. I will put their Twitter details in the description at the end of the video. But we are going to sit down, potentially have a beer. I'm certainly having one. Reese, I don't think drinks a lot. Jack's probably drinking baby formula. Um, but yeah, just have a chat about everything going on at the football club. Summer transfer window tonight, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on We'll touch on the first month of the season in terms of results and performances, but obviously the big subject at the moment will be the chairman, who's been quite vocal on social media without being on social media over the last few weeks. Uh, but first of all, Jack, Reese, thank you for coming on. Hope you're both well. Cheers, mate. And to you. All good, cheers, mate. All good, good, good. Right, let's crack straight on then. So, first subject... Need to talk about it. Uh, summer transfer window. Transfer window closed on Tuesday night. Uh, we certainly didn't get as many in as I'd hoped on the final day of the window. Charlie Kelman, for me, looked like a decent signing. Certainly gives us something different in terms of the forwards that we've got. But I'll come to you first, Jack. Um, what did you make, firstly, of the Kelman signing and also the transfer window as a whole? There was four major outs and there was, you know, a good double figures again in terms of players coming in. But what, what did you make of the business? I'd, I'd probably say, Matt, that we, um, we've probably not replaced the people we've let go as well as we could have done. But then that's the nature of the business that we do, really. Um, it's not necessarily a massive dig, but, you know, Ogilvy, Bonham, Graham, very hard to replace at this level. And with the sort of money we probably offer players, it's going to be difficult to, to bring in people that are better. So I'd say that we've probably got a weaker squad than what we had last year, if I'm honest. Um, and I'd probably say we're probably a couple short. Um, notably at left back, I'd, I would probably say. And Kelman, I think on paper, looks an OK signing. I mean, the guy's got six goals in, what, 40 games. Doesn't make great reading. But then when you go back to people like Tom Eaves, who had no goals for Yeovil, you do kind of temper that slightly in your head. And he's only 19. And there's quite a lot of sub-appearances for QPR. So not one that set the pulses racing. Um, but equally, that would look, you know, willing to give the lad a chance. I think it's gone down not brilliantly with the supporters because of the fact that we've, you've, we've got really only one other striker, you know, in, in Oliver. We have got a kindy, but he doesn't care, really, if we're being honest. So, you know, we've, we've not got an amazing strike force. So I think it went down. It didn't go down brilliantly with the supporters, I would say. They're willing to give him a chance. But um, I suppose the, the summary is we could be better, the transfer window, as it always probably could be with the club. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I think I'm probably something similar along the lines in terms of, one slight disagreement was Jack Bonham. I think we probably, I think we're stronger as a collective unit in goalkeeper because I think Aaron Chapman's a more than able number two. He's further along in what than what Joe Walsh was that we had for the last two seasons. And I think Jamie Cumming will prove to be a very good keeper at this level. Was decent at Stevenage. Reese, what's your thoughts? I think uh, the, obviously the two main departures were, were Jordan Graham and Connor Ogilvy. And I think is it fair to say that whoever came in, we was going to downgrade. Unfortunately, that's as, as Jack said, that's the nature of the beast at this level. Yeah, without a doubt. And to be honest, it was it was no real surprise to see either of them leave. Obviously, the frustrating thing with Ogilvy was that he sort of strung us along a little bit towards the end and gave us that little bit of hope. Um, but in the main, I think our transfer window in terms of who we've brought in was OK. It just comes down to the question, like you've both just mentioned, of did we bring enough in? Um, I think Evans signed more experienced players this summer in comparison to last, which I think was a sensible decision. Um, I thought in the end we struggled in the first half of last season and ended up getting that rid of a lot of the young loan players, didn't he? And then and bringing people like Lee back into the back into the fold in the second half of the season. So I think that's a good move. And I agree with Jack. The one big problem for me is left back that we've we've signed someone who, admittedly, it's early days in his Jill's career, but he looks like a left back that was third choice at a team that got relegated last season. Um, and the worrying thing for me is that. He looks a poor footballer and he's a poor footballer with no competition to even push him along. Um, and I think unless we look in the free agent market, which it looks like we can do now, I think that could be a problem position for us. Yeah, I said I spoke to Bos and Stocky at Wimbledon because that was the first time that, that us three had all been in the ground together for the first time since pre-COVID. So sort of 18 months and that was Stocky's first look at him, I think, or, or the Morecambe game. Um, 
Yeah, it must have been Morgan because he was. Oh no, it was, it was Wimbledon, wasn't it? Because that's the night he got sent off. But we said he looks like a teenager learning the game, but he's actually 25 years old, which is a bit concerning because by that time you should have sort of ironed out them mistakes that you're making as a 17, 18, 19 year old. And for me, I don't know what you think, Jack, but but Bailey Akers has shown more composure in the appearances I've seen him make, albeit in cup games against opposition that have made a lot of changes as well. No, I agree. I think there's um I think there is a, an element of of you know you should you should blood youngsters and we should do more of that because you know we've 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 made a decent return on some players in the past. So I wouldn't be against that. It's just it's frustrating that you have to resort to that, I suppose, is, is probably the point. I think Evans probably shares that same thought as well, really. Yeah, I think he said that there will be good players in, you know, six months, a year, 18 months, two years, but we shouldn't be expecting them to play 40 games right now. It's not fair on them and it certainly won't help us as a football club. But if I said to both of you then, as a transfer window, if you had to rate it out of 10 before we get on to the next subject, um, Jack, what would you say? Probably probably a seven. I don't want to be too negative. I think when you look at the squad... I think it's actually half decent. It's it's not as good as last year. It's not terrible. We've brought in some half decent players for this level, but it's just it's not an Ipswich transfer window, which is never going to be. Let's be honest. Um, but you know, yeah, I'd say I'd say seven it, based on as of today. Um, but we should have we should have brought more in. That probably is the is the key takeaway for me. I, I thought you'd go a bit lower to be fair. So that was a little bit surprising. I thought you'd have gone based on six, the players we've the signed. Based on the players we've signed, I'd say a seven. If you based it on the numbers we've brought in, probably a six. And it drops, that's fair enough. And what about you, Reese? Yeah, I'd probably go along with that to me. Six, probably six and a half, maybe. Maybe I'll go slightly less. Because um, like Jack says, in terms, just more in terms of downside is the numbers. And we've not managed to be, obviously we've lost Graham Ogilvy Bonham and we've not brought in a, a Dempsey or a Graham type. But on the flip side, we've kept hold of Dempsey, Tucker, Oliver. Um, which are massive assets for us. And, you know, people like Cumming, people like Lloyd, people like Carriol, look like really useful additions for us. So I agree with Jack that I think if we had everyone fit, I think our strongest 11 looks quite handy. It's just obviously the problem comes when we've had situations like we have at the start of the season where we're light on numbers. That's all of a sudden when it, it, it will catch us out. And there probably will be more times during the season where two or three get injured and we start looking like we're up against it a little bit. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I someone. I think it was D three, D four tweeted and said that, that they tweeted an article out and said the, the winners and the losers of the transfer window, and they put us in as losers. And I said, and I think they gave us like a, an F or someone did. And I said, I thought an F was a bit harsh because if you're rating it A to F, you're indicating that nothing's gone right in the transfer window. And I think Evans has done the right thing, like one of you alluded to earlier, and said that we've gone more experienced because I think we went too far the other way last season with Medley and Coyle and. Uh, Eccles, Drysdale, it didn't really work out. I know Eccles has gone back and he's playing first team for Coventry, but on the whole, as a collective, it, it didn't really work. And a lot of, they all went back in January, which which says all you need to know. But again, I have to agree, numbers were probably one or two short. If we got in another left back and maybe sacrificed a centre midfielder, which is what I looked at today, and I said, do we really need Adseed and Dan Phillips with the amount of centre midfielders we got? Could we have maybe sacrificed one of them and got in a winger or another centre forward or a left back? Um, then we'd have more balance. But I started doing a bit of digging as well. And it's weird because as we've all spoken on Twitter and we've all seen it and everyone's probably had a rough couple of weeks and I tweeted something along them lines yesterday because there's been this negativity, toxicity around the ground at the moment and around the situation of someone's comments, which we'll get on to later in the video. I think we've all sort of forgot about the football side a little bit. So I did have a look and it's weird that 2019-20, which was Evans' first season, come the end of that transfer window in the August, we had 21 senior pros. I'm not saying they all worked out, but that was come 31st of August 2019. 31st of August 2020, we had 22 senior pros. So it was one more. We've got 20 this year. So in terms of numbers, we're not miles out. But I think it probably looks worse because... We had an injury crisis from straight away in pre-season. Then we had COVID and I think that probably had an effect as well. So we look like we're playing catch up. But yeah, generally I'd probably agree and say seven for the signings we've made was never going to upgrade on Ogilvy, was never going to upgrade on Jordan Graham. But the fact that we're probably one or two short proxy drops it down to a six, six and a half. Like you said, if we got them in, it might have been an eight because you don't know what the quality would have been. So we're only sort of guessing. But... I, you know what, I Matt, think I was we'll just be... going to say, 
Go an on. interesting point that Reese brought up just in terms of, I, I think I'm in the minority here, but um, when it comes to selling players, I actually think this is going to go down probably poorly with people on, on Twitter, but I think we should sell players because if I look back, I started going to watch Gillingham in 1995. And mm -hmm. from, from 95 to about 2002, our whole transfer strategy was buy players, sell players. We sold Tony Butler. We sold Jimmy Corbett. We then uh, bought Hessenthaler, Butters, Asabo. So we funded our promotion Tyler. season. Taylor off the back of selling players. So for me... I would actually, I think he probably doesn't do it because he realises what sort of stick he'd get. But when you look at the money we could have got for Dak, what we could have got for Egan, what we could have got for Eves, what we, we could have got for Graham, Dempsey and Tucker, no doubt, will go for free. We, although we keep hold of our assets, we don't do anything of a season to keep them. We're not in really a promotion battle, let's be honest. Or at We're least, why do we not get halfway through the season and make them sign a new contract? And then if they go in the summer, we can get a fee for them. Every other club does it. You see it throughout the season. Every other club signing, oh, someone signed another two-year contract. We just let them run down. And then, like you say, they walk away for nothing. Or, as Reese mentioned, Connor Ogilvy was Brandon and Mark too. We, we help him out with the training all summer and then he buggers off somewhere else, which is never helpful to anyone. I, I reckon we probably do offer him contracts, to be fair. We just don't know about it and they turn them down, which we, I wouldn't blame them for doing, in fairness. But for me, we always give people two-year contracts, which is probably wise. But, you know, for the likes of Eves, we could have got a couple of hundred grand for him. You know, Dak, three million. You know, what that, what that could have funded is it really worth keeping hold of them at this level? Are, are, well, are we going to go up? Dak, I understand the DAC one because we were in, we were actually we were in a promotion, promotion battle, battle yeah. we were, but the other ones, I, tell you, what's your, I don't know what your thoughts are on that one, Reese. but I, the DAC one, I can understand Scally holding on to him because we were, we was in the playoffs in January, weren't we? I think we were still, no, I think we might have even been top of the league. I think we went yeah. top just after the new year, didn't we beat someone like Bradford or Colchester at home and obviously it all unravelled, but Scally's a lot of things, but he's not got a crystal ball and, he couldn't foresee that, that John Egan and Bradley Dack had both gone rip hamstring in the running. But the others, I think Jack's got a very valid point. We know that after the end of their contracts, these star players are probably just going to walk away for nothing unless they're underage and we get a tribunal fee for them. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to sound like Steve Evans here, who I mentioned about, but I think it's what Darrow does at Peterborough, which I quite like, is that whenever they have a player go into the final year of their contract, he puts them on the transfer list. So it's basically, we, give, we sign players if we like what they're doing after a year we'll offer them a new one they're not interested we'll try and sell them and gauge it that way because yeah I do it is Jack spot on that if, if we'd have sold Dempsey and Tucker Tuesday night then we'd be having a completely different conversation now to the one we're going to be having but there is also business logic behind it and especially I think when you've got someone like Evans in charge where had we have made a million for Dempsey and Tucker and Scally had gone to Evans is 400, 500 grand to go and buy some players I think he possibly could have improved the squad on that as a whole but we'll never know we'll never plus know. you need time to do that you can't expect him to go and do that with six hours of the window left yeah. if they was going to do that they should have sold him middle of August or start of August but it's, it's I, I think the strategy too, works fairly. I think the strategy works and because Peter will prove it and we proved it under the same chairman we've got now. I, I don't get why we don't do it anymore. But, but you know, people no, you're right. cry foul of selling players. But, you know, we're chilling and we're not going to keep hold of players forever, are we? Yeah, and like you say, we, we'll lose Dempsey for nothing. We'll lose Tucker for a tribunal fee. We won't get anyone in to replace them of the same quality. At least if you sell them, you can go and get in three or four that are maybe slightly under that quality. So you, could, you lose a 10 out of 10, but you can probably get four, eight or nine out of 10s in with the money. Whereas if you let him go for nothing you then have to go and buy five, six out of tens on a free transfer, which exactly. leaves yourself playing catch-up all the time. Right, that's probably the transfer window cover. That was really, really good. That I enjoyed that. Um, let's talk briefly before we get on to the chairman. Um, first month of the season, we played seven fixtures in uh, the league and the League Cup. One win in 90 minutes, two defeats in 90 minutes, four draws, including one penalty shootout win that's only just finished, and one penalty shootout defeat. Um, what have you made of the first month of the season, Reese, in terms of performances? Um, to, be, to be honest, in terms of the, the two cup games, I'm not particularly bothered. I think Evan said himself that he, he wasn't particularly bothered because of the situation we was in with the squad. But in terms of the league situation, I think it's when the fixtures come out, if you looked at our first five games, I think a lot of us thought they were, they were quite good-looking games on paper. So to, to only have five points is probably a little bit disappointing from what I'd have expected. But then I also, 
I don't really blame the players and the management too much for that because of the situation we've been in in terms of having such a, a skeleton squad and then the injury situation as well. And, you know, I think the first game of the season against Lincoln, I thought we was pretty good on the whole. Um, the win against Morecambe, I thought we played pretty, pretty well. Um, Plymouth and Wimbledon, I thought we were shocking. I know we obviously had a conflict, conflict of opinions after Plymouth, but looking now at how things unfolded after that, it maybe was we were so bad at Plymouth and Wimbledon because despite the fact we was only two games into the season, the squad was so small, it's so unfit that we were just running out of steam. And I think Saturday's game against Shrewsbury epitomised that, that first half we was OK. And in second half, it was plainly obvious that Jackson and Oliver, just to name two, were playing unfit. And I just think we completely ran out of steam after 45 minutes, which is which is concerning, um, especially when we've only added one body since then. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I was at Shrewsbury, you two weren't. And I said on my match day live and on my Monday review that for 40 minutes we were really good. And Jackson, I had down as our man of the match, which I said on the Monday review, people might shoot me down because he only played 40 minutes. Um, and I think I'm in, not the minority, but certainly in a smaller pool of people that, that think Jackson's all right as a right back. Um, but he was provided us pace. He was getting us eye up the pitch. He was giving us an outlet. He was pushing their full backs and their wing backs back. And we were really good. As soon as he went off, that all stopped. We dropped off. And then you couple that with the fact that Carrie Owen Oliver shouldn't have been starting. Steve Evans confirmed that. But Dane Oliver should have been nowhere near Shrewsbury on Saturday afternoon. He could barely run. Um, David Tatonda comes on for the injured Ryan Jackson. He's just come back from a dead leg. Uh, Robbie McKenzie had no pre-season. Carl Dempsey's had a thigh strain. Stuart O'Keefe was left out. So was that another knock? Dan Phillips hadn't started a game since Plymouth three weeks previous. It's it's half a team that's that's probably running at seventy percent capacity, and you can't you can't dream of winning games, let alone try and actually do it on a football pitch if you if you're that woefully unfit, Jack. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, no, I'd agree, Matt. I'll be honest, Matt. I've I've not been to any game this season purely because my wife was due on the twelfth of August and gave birth on the twenty third, so I've not had a chance to go to any any games this season. Unfortunately, I'd love to have done Wimbledon; would have been a new ground, but and I would have done the others, no doubt. Um, so I can't comment necessarily on the football because I've not actually seen it, if I'm honest. But based on what everyone said, I'd go along with exactly what Reese said earlier. You know, it's you'd have thought we'd have done slightly better, but there's mitigating factors behind it. Uh, that would be my assessment of it without having seen it. Yeah, COVID obviously was the massive one. We lost three weeks of pre-season. I think Evan said that some players lost 20 days, didn't they? Because they had to self-isolate because they got the notification. And then they actually tested positive actually themselves. They had to do it again. So... And that's David David Tatonda was one of them. So maybe we should give him a little bit more leeway, but how much leeway? We can't keep saying it's because of COVID, it's because they're unfit, it's because we didn't have a summer, because other clubs have had that as well. Yeah, it's, but, it's not, it was not an amazing start. Not an amazing start, but, you know, if we carry on like this, we'll finish probably mid-table. I trust Evans that we will do that, but I don't... It, it's not going to be a promotion battle, in my opinion. It's either going to be mid-table or a relegation battle. Yeah, I said 10th in my pre-season video. And at the moment, I'd probably say I've been slightly overly optimistic. What about you, Reese? What do you think? Yeah, I still think at the moment, I think we're, we're looking at a mid-table finish. You know, all the time Evans is here, we've got, we've got no worries about relegation, that's for sure. Even with a, an underpass squad, Evans will still get a team organised that will pick up points where you don't expect them to. But, I think the fear of a week or so ago was that Evans looked like he had one foot out the door. And had he, if Evans was to leave this side of Christmas, for example, I think we're in massive trouble. But fortunately, whether, whether he's been told to come out and say what he said or not, he looks a little bit more assured at the moment of his future, which is, which is positive. So I still think, yeah, unless we pull off two or three free agents that are going to take us to the next step, which is going to be really, really difficult, um, I think we're looking at mid-table again. Right. That brings us nicely on to our next subject. That video that Reese alludes to was Steve Evans round the table in the sunshine at a hotel in Shrewsbury with uh, club sponsor Damien from Beauville, yeah. uh, a director whose name escapes me, Paul Scally, and like I say, the gaffer. Now, I don't know what you think. For me, it looked the most staged thing in the world. It looked like Paul Scally had gone... Yeah. The fans are being horrible to me. Can you all come and sit with me and tell everyone what a wonderful job and how hard I'm trying? Yeah, no, they've come across like that to me, Matt. Um, I think I think the main thing for me, I mean, I, I've, I would say for the last probably four or five years, I've been 
a scally out person. I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, I, I was level headed up until that point um, and felt that criticism was a little bit, you know, misguided at times. I, I've, I know I'm scally out. Um, he, he can't take criticism. is probably what I would say. Um, it, any sort of dissent, you know, amongst the fans or any legitimate criticism we throw at him. And it is genuinely legitimate if he took a look in the mirror and actually and thought about it for a second. Um, he sees it as a slight against the club. Obviously, I didn't go Shrewsbury. Uh, I've been to Carlisle in the past. You know, we, we've all been to the, the Sunderland as well. And to say the likes of yourselves that that went six, seven hundred mile round trip to Shrewsbury aren't proper fans for shouting Scully out is tone deaf for me. You know, just listen to the criticisms that people are putting your way rather than dismissing them offhand and acting like a dictator is, is what I would say to him. No, you're right. I totally agree because we all have opinions. We could sit here, we're having this chat tonight. We don't all agree with each other. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to turn around and go, oh, Jack said something that I don't agree with, so he's not coming on my channel. But Reese can because he agrees with what I'm saying. And that's what it is. That's essentially what it is, but just on a far grander scale. And I get that. And I tweeted yesterday, I did, you know, one of them, I went off on a on one and, and it was about five or six tweets long. And I, I said, I ended it with Paul Scally, we appreciate and understand what you did for us when you came into the club in 1995 and we appreciate what you did over the last 26 years because under your stewardship we've been to Wembley three times we've been promoted into the championship we had seven brilliant years no eight nine brilliant years from two from 95 right through till to when we dropped back out of the championship so you're looking at the best part of a decade is probably the best decade this football club's ever had he's rebuilt the ground but that was 15 years ago when that all stopped we've been yo-yoing essentially between Leagues 1 and League 2 for the last decade or so. We're the most established club in League 1 now, now that Peterborough have got promoted. You look at sides, I think the biggest comparison all the time, Reese, is, is Brighton. They were renting our ground out. They were effectively lodgers at our place back in the late 90s. And now they're off in this big brand new stadium in the Premier League, hosting England internationals and England Lionesses games. And then it comes on to the, the hunt for investment. And I think someone tweeted the other day and made a really good point and said, if you've been looking that hard for 15 years for investment or however long it is, that's fine. But at what point does someone have to say, if you're looking that hard for that long, maybe you're not doing it right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's fair. Um, and I think probably my viewpoint on the on the chairman might be one that a lot of people are starting to resonate with now because I think I've missed one home game in about 10 years. Um, and it, when COVID would come around, I was at one point pretty set in my mind that I wasn't going to bother with a season to get anymore. Just out of the way the club went about treating season ticket holders during that period, you know, we hardly got any communication for the best part of 12 months. And when we did... All it seemed to be was an attack that if you was asking for a refund on your season ticket for games that never happened, you wasn't a supporter. And it was as if that he forgot that it wasn't only Gillingham Football Club that was being affected by COVID. You know, these are genuine fans that have got bills to pay. They've got food to put on the table. And it was out those they was being made a villain to ask for, for money back for something which never happened. But because I missed the social side of it so much, eventually I gave in. And five games in, I'm already sitting here thinking, well, I was told that by donating my 2019-20 money, I'd be given five free tickets for games this season. I've asked the club twice what, how I go about redeeming and been met with a wall of silence. And then we've been told that we'd be getting free shirts for this season, for this season, season tickets. We're over 10% of the way through the season now. I've not got it. And it's because of COVID issues for Macron. Well, we're not the only club that use Macron and everyone else seems to have them, have them fine. So I just think that along with, we're now, we're clear, he's clearly not capable of building a, competitive squad at this level anymore in terms of depth which isn't his problem if he's not got the money to do it he's not got the money to do it we're not asking him to spend money that he, he doesn't have but like you've just said if he's been looking for 15 years and he can't find that money maybe it's best he starts looking for someone else that can come in and try and take the football club to the next level what well, exactly. well, I'd also say mate with that is you know it, the thing he needs to worry about it isn't so much the likes of Reese. uh well what what has happened in the past is we used to have average what six seven eight nine thousand and albeit some of it was at the championship level but a lot of it was at league one levels so we've lost probably half our supporter base in about 10 years and he has to ask himself why you know there's a lack of ambition in my opinion he's got 
champagne aspirations on lemonade money is the best way to describe it. And and 4,000 people have silently walked away. So you're now having a go at people that are actually paying you money who are still going. People went to Shrewsbury and you're not calling them proper fans. I, I, like I said, it's, it's tone deaf, brain dead comments. It's just the standard line he churns out every single time anyone puts up any sort of criticism against him. Like I said, it's, it's dictator-esque. It's, there's no goodwill in any way from him to try and understand what issues are. And even the ones that we do put forward, nothing gets done about them. You know, the refunds for season tickets took forever to communicate it, as Reese says. It, even little things, people laugh about this because I constantly go on about it on Twitter. I but what you're going to say. False promises around stuff like self-service pumps. There we go. I got it in. <laughs> the e-ticketing e system took four years or whatever. He's been looking for a new ground since 1998. So not, not only is he driving supporters away, what he, what he says, he never acts on and, and never, it, it's just, it's, it's waffle to sell season tickets every season. And this is exactly what his chairman's chat is at the moment. It's for me, it's waffle. And there's nothing he puts forward that's a vision for the future. It's a vanity exercise that he's doing uh, to begin with. And now he's coming onto him very defensive because he's, he's realizing what people actually think of him. And, and the, the, the thing that struck me about this is the fact that we've, I've been Skelly out for a while, you know, openly. I don't think either of you have, and I don't necessarily think you are, you know, now my, now it's to the wall, I'm Skelly out. But I think both of you would happily see him go now. And it's off the back of these chats because people have actually seen what he's like. Yeah. Happily see him go, maybe. But at, all, at the end of the day, all we want, us three, everyone that keeps going to Shrewsbury, keeps going to watch EFL trophy games on a Tuesday night or some crappy League Cup game in front of a thousand people. Essentially, all we want is our club to be as good as it can be. And I think a lot of people now don't think it can be as good as it can be all the time that Paul Scully's in charge because... Is he seriously thinking that not one person has shown an interest to offer a substantial amount of money for us to be able to take the club forward, whether that's with him involved or buy him out? And for me, no, I think someone has shown interest. And I think it comes back a little bit to like you said, it is all coming across as very dictatorial at the moment. And he, he just comes across as a control freak. Yeah. It's like this was uh, mine in 95. It's still mine now, and almost the only way to go is if we wheel him out in a box. The, the, the reason he'd done so well back in the day is he had the goodwill because he took over the club when we was potentially going under, which, which was great of him to do. Um, and, and as I've said, he, the way we did business lent itself to being successful. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying, I want us to be in the championship. Some people are sitting there going, well, we should be a championship club. Don't think we've got a divine right. We're a League One team that attracts 4,000 people, albeit I think that's his fault, personally. But I'm not expecting him to spend loads. I'm not expecting us to be in the championship. For me, if, we, if a new chairman came in and was exactly the same as him in terms of spending, but was a brand new person, wasn't so adversarial against the fans and just injected a bit of life into the club, I'd take that. I, I think the fact that we don't spend any money on anyone, coupled with everything else, is why we're at where we're at. It's, it's a build-up of all those things put together. It's, it's not saying, oh, we should be in the championship as a divine right. Not for me. Some people might think that. It's all the other little things that go along with the fact we don't have, seem to have any ambition. It's, it's almost like, I think I get what Jack's saying, Rich. It's almost like he's just sucking the fun out of it. We know that we all take a chance, whether we go to a home game on a Saturday and a away game on a Tuesday, we take our chance. That's football. We, we lose more than we win generally at the moment, and that's fine. But it's, it's almost like the social aspect's been taken away because this ship that's ready to sail, we get every week, every fortnight in these chairman chats. And then in the next one, it's, oh, the factory's being rebuilt because there was more work to do. The piano bar's having to be refurbed. Bear with us. We've got no staff. There's no hot food. The kiosks are not open. We haven't got a chef. So which one is it? I think that's one of the biggest frustrations is you get fed two different stories very quickly next to each other and it's almost like the boy who cried wolf you, you stop believing him eventually because you just think it is like jack said it, it just becomes waffle 
Yeah, and I think with these chairman chats as well is that he's come out of it straight out of the pandemic, and I think he's got his priorities all wrong. You know, we've not been we've not been allowed to set foot in a football ground for eighteen months. All the supporters we cared about was one getting back in the football ground and two having a competitive football team and the whole process of sorting tickets out and going through that online system was a it was a fast to start with it's getting better now but it was a joke to start with and we're sitting here saying that we've got an inadequate squad but it's all right because Whitney Houston was meant to be coming but priority number one is yeah I understand that a pizza factory and the factory itself and tribute nights will bring in extra revenue for the club I understand that but priority number one is the football team. Get a competitive football team and you get more fans through the door on a Saturday. So you get more people in the factory as a byproduct. And you might get more people interested in coming to your events. And I think another thing that has really started to grate on people, me especially, is coming out of these chairman chats and the way he's, he brands people not fans if they criticise him is that a lot of people say Evans comes out with a lot of waffle as well at times. And as much as I like Evans, there is probably an element of truth in that. But one thing that he's always said, which is absolutely spot on, is that the real owners of any football club are, are the supporters. And with Scally, he makes it out like it's Paul Scally FC and not Gillingham FC. If you don't support Scally, you don't support the club. And I think that's an outrageous statement to make personally. Because like Jack says, a lot of us, all three of us here over the years, as, as well as probably a good 1,500, 2,000 of that loyal core, spend probably thousands on that football club every year. And to be told that you're not a supporter because you don't agree with the man who's running the club or the direction he's taken it in is, is in my opinion, a scandal. Another thing, and I know, and we we keep saying that we sound petty about a couple of things, but we go back to this Whitney Houston thing. So, number one for me, if he wants to make it a big event, why put it on the day of a game that is likely to be called off because Charlton have got internationals? Number two... Why then cancel it if there's so much interest? Because that's what you told us. It was going to be a sellout. Whitney Houston was the greatest thing ever um, because his mate down the Marlow got it on a, a discount or whatever. So why cancel it if there was that much interest? Because that's still, an in, that's a, still a, a revenue stream. And number three, how comes everyone's got a refund on that straight away? Yet people haven't had a refund on tickets for MK Dons away from March 2020. What I said on Twitter, mate, was um, what I don't get as well with that is put aside all the jokes and everything like that you've got a captive audience of a couple of thousand football fans. Do I really sit at home listening to Whitney Houston? Probably not. No, I don't. The missus does. Oasis, you know, get an actual, if you're going to do a tribute act, actually capture the audience that you've got in the factory that would, would, would stay in and, and watch it. I, I, I think if you put aside all the, the nonsense of the, of the, the whole act and the, the hilarity of, of it, I don't think it was a good idea to begin with anyway, based on, on the audience. He, it shows he doesn't know his customers properly. And, it, and as we've already probably alluded to, I don't think he really cares about his customers. I think he assumes that a couple of thousand will pay for a season ticket every season, which they have done. But that, even that's dwindling, which, which, is, which is something to worry about, really. And, and, and the other thing that, that grates on me, which is, uh, I'll, I'll say allegedly, because I'm, I'm not sure if this is completely true, but from what I understand, you know, we've taken out a business loan here of something like 300,000, which only us and Fleetwood apparently have, have done, apparently. Uh, he's paid himself allegedly 46,000 pounds more in that time. So again, when you couple all of this together, along with that, and in pleading poverty and saying, and all these things around what the fans are doing and whatnot, the fact that he's actually paid himself more money, allegedly, really leaves a sour taste to, I think, non scally out people, let alone the ones that wanted him out before this. Yeah, and it also ties in with the fact that he's gone on about in this article that got released by Kent Online today on the back of the chanting at Shrewsbury last week that people don't know how many hours I work. I work X amount of hours a day. That's fine. And I don't think anyone's disputing that. And if you are, then good luck to you and thank you very much. But don't moan about it when you're being paid X amount because I'm sure Paul Scally's hourly rate, if he's doing a 16 hour day, is a darn sight more than my hourly rate doing my job. And don't moan that you're having to do it all on your own when you got rid of all your staff, which again, I understand because there was a pandemic, but you got rid of a club secretary who'd been there for 30 years, was there long before you, Paul Scally. And what did she get? A tiny little article in the newspaper. I don't think there was anything proper officially announced by the club. I thought that was downright disrespectful. And 
would all of these problems happened if Gwen Pointer was there proofreading everything and doing her job? I'd imagine not. Probably not. I think the abuse that he gets, uh, for, if anyone is, you know, violent towards him or, or uses the C word or anything like that, I, I don't condone that at all. And, and he has reason to be, you know, to, to moan about that, rightfully so. I think what he's doing here is just a con constant back and forth. And, and I, I guarantee that chairman's chat that he puts out in the next few days will just be him defending himself again and saying how, how bad we are as fans. And, and he's doing nothing to build bridges. And, and I don't think he wants to. I don't think it's in his personality. I think he's a bit of a bit of a narcissist, a bit, bit of a dictator, as we've said. Uh, and I, I don't think he's attempting to build bridges. And all this is going to do, if he keeps his chairman's chats up, is further alienate himself from the fans and lead to, to more and more chance against him, which, you know... It, it comes across very fragile personality. Personally, if, if, if it were me, I, I'd try and let it sort of. If you're if you're a football chairman and you get that frustrated at fans singing your name, you know, wanting him to leave, you might be in the wrong job. You might be in the wrong job. Uh, when you consider everything he's done or not done, and the things he says about the fans and stuff, if he called the fans cancer after the Blackpool away game a couple of years ago because they had, they dared call for his name. To, be, to leave then and, and and yet we're not allowed to say we want Scally out but you're allowed to call us cancer he's just he's a hypocrite is is the long and short of it and also Reese, in that last staged as we called it video last Saturday that came out at midnight which was quite strategically timed if if you want to be cynical <laughs> he said we can't be negative we have to do away with the negativity we can't say a word against him but if team selection or performance is a crap, you can dig out Evans and Rayner. So it was almost like he was saying, you can slag off the management all you like, but dare come near me and I'll start shouting and chucking my toys out of the pram. That's how it came across to me. No, that's exactly how it came across to me. That's exactly how it was. And like, like Jack just said, all, and the thing, the thing is, it's one of them where maybe we've learned a lesson as fans to, sort of to practice what we preach. Because I think for quite a long time, we've all been calling for Scully to come out and, and talk to us about what's going on at the club. And now every week he comes out and speaks, he's just digging himself a bigger hole. Um, because like Jack says, it's full of hypocrisy. It's from, from like he says, pleading poverty um, about the club during COVID, which, by the way, like I said earlier, Gillingham Football Club aren't the only club that, are, that have suffered through COVID. There's, there's, you know, 71 others in the Football League, yet they're not all coming out with the same problems as us. So, so with that, he's... He's saying if you want a refund on your season ticket, uh, eventually, he said, I'll honour that. But you have to have it paid over three years. Yet, like Jack alludes to, he gives himself a pay rise. Doesn't quite add up. I just think, yeah, the, the more he talks, the more he is alienating people. And, and the more he is going to lead people to call him, call him for him to go. And just he just cannot open his mouth without having a dig that, that helped pay the bills at the football club. I just cannot get my head around it. And and yeah, I thought I may, maybe it's just me being a cynic, but I thought the tweet from the club today was was a threat. Why would they tweet that he's seeing lawyers? I think it's to try and to put people off tweeting what they've been tweeting, despite the fact that, listen, I don't read every single forum that exists about the football club, but on Twitter anyway, I can't say that I've seen what I would classify as abuse. I've seen people raising their thoughts, a lot of them well thought out, and having general good conversation, saying that they believe the club needs to take a step forward. You know, he's been the long, I think he's the longest serving owner in the football league now. So to do as long as he has is quite uncommon. And people just believe it's time for a change and they're entitled to express that opinion whichever way they like. Um, providing it's, we're not, you know, we've seen much worse. We're not throwing tennis balls on the pitch. We're not pitch invading. We're not storming his box. People are paying, you know, probably 120 quid for an away game to go up to Shrewsbury and they're making their voice heard because otherwise, how else is he going to get the message that, that people are getting fed up with what's going on? Because the more we sit back and say nothing, the more he'll carry on running the football club into the ground. And, you know, we all care about this club just as deeply, if not more so than him. And we'll still be here once he eventually goes. And all we want is what's best for the football club. And unfortunately, I think COVID has just brought out a lot to Ruth that was perhaps sort of bubbling away under this, behind the scenes before COVID come, people are fed up with it. And yeah, I'm I'm very much moving to that side of the fence now that, like Jack said, is 
if he was to put the club up for sale tomorrow and say he was he was going to move on, no complaints from me. I, th- I think, you know, if, if you're saying something libelous or you're being violently abusive towards him, you deserve everything you get, personally. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Um, so so th- there is that. To have a difference of opinion it is, is very, yeah. um, you know, Stalin-esque, for the want of a better way of putting it, potentially. It's, it's just... Uh, just uh, staggering really to be honest and and Reece says we don't throw tennis balls on the pitch I, I think it may come to that at some point if it carries on the way the way it's going but personally you know so it's it's a it's a sad state of affairs and I, I just don't see it getting any better with him because even his most ardent supporters are probably in in around the five ten percent mark now if that and, and the ones that were have slowly moved into kind of sitting on the fence and the ones like you that are sit- were sitting on the fence before are very much... Yeah, it's just all been oh, a shift away shift. from him, hasn't there, unfortunately. It's all just shuffling across, unfortunately. And we, as fans, we don't want to be sitting here. I don't want to be sitting here doing this Jules in the Pub series, new series, whatever you want to call it, talking to Jack and Reese about the chairman and what's going wrong. I'd much rather invite them both on and sit in here be talking about what a good squad we've got, how good the results are, how brilliant the football is, and the fact that we're in the top half of the league and we're challenging for promotion. But the, the, the reason I run this channel is for fans to have a voice, to allow fans that live abroad or further away that can't get to the club to have some sort of connectivity. So we have to talk about what's going on. So if Paul Scally is watching this, and I highly doubt he is, we're not doing it to just be horrible or have a dig at Paul Scally. We're doing it because we genuinely have concerns about the way that the club's being run. And that doesn't mean we have all the answers. We're not experts. We're not chairman. I understand that. But you simply cannot call us out and say we're not proper supporters just because we don't agree with everything you do. No, I agree. Uh, the guy paid a pound for the club. You know, he's done very well off the, off the back of this, you know, and good, good on him. You know, he took the, he had the, the cojones to go and do it back in the nineties. But for me, you know, you're in your sixties now, Paul, retire happy without any stress, you know, let us move the club forward. Let someone take it on that was actually willing to invest in the club and and don't make yourself uh from what i've been told again it's alleged but it, for, people have offered, offered you know to buy the club and one of the stipulations was that he had to stay in the job as a as chairman which to me sort of harps back to the narcissism you know it, i want to sell the club and make money but you still want me to take home two three hundred i still want to run it yeah it's again control for it like you say yeah it's 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 just an unwillingness to let go isn't it which is was sad and like you said he's he's not getting any younger and he had massive open heart surgery a few years ago as well so why not take your money and retire to dubai and enjoy the life it's i don't know and we know that life's not always you know grass isn't always greener is it Reese? but but sometimes i think it gets to the point where you just have to take a chance a little bit and if if the fa do their job and the efl do their job and we get someone that comes in i think it's been rumored that, that colin has at jarvis at, at mems has, has tried to to put offers in previously i don't think there's any risk of him coming in and, and and acting inappropriately towards the club because he's a lifelong gillingham fan in the same way that damien at Beauville is but something's got to change at the moment i think because I, I, it's I the agree, most I, I've felt that we're we're just stagnating and we're just basically we feel like we're going with one foot now to the floor at the moment and we're just going around in circles every season. No, and I think another thing that he he mentions and sort of uses it as a threat against against the club as well. And first of all, that I think a lot of his uh, Jackson's his aunt supporters would always say, "We are what we are. Be careful." what you wish for, worst that can happen, we go down to lead two, we've been there before and come back. But the big problem with that is what Jack brought up earlier is crowds. Even previously, last time when I've seen, whenever I've seen it's been in league two, we've still had sort of a solid four and a half, five, five and a half thousand attendance there. If we were to end up in league two anytime soon under Paul Scaly, we're looking at probably sub two and a half thousand crowds. Then all of a sudden getting out of league two becomes a real problem and you start looking at the other way which I don't want to talk about because I've never seen Gillingham there and I don't think either of you two have or have any plans to see us there. And it's the threat that he comes out, come out of in today's thing is that what would happen if I walked away from the club tomorrow? Well, yes, it would be a challenge for sure, but he's not one of these owners like a Man City or, or the, the, the ones that went into Ebb's fleet where they're bankrolled in the club. He doesn't have a lot of money to put into the club. So it's not like if he walked away, he's walking away with millions of pounds of investment into the football club. I don't think an awful lot 
we're changing the short term. Oh, you're to right, because in terms of the wage bill and everything, it's not like someone's going to have to come in and tell all the players they've got to take fifty percent pay cuts or anything like that, because we are one of the lowest players in the in the division. So yeah, I totally agree. Jack? And we four thousand fans for the first game back after a pandemic. Second. You would that that's well, okay. So first home game was it? No, second. We had Lincoln the second first day, didn't oh, we? Yeah. But again, the, no, there was, the there was still was four thousand though. Uh, it's still four and a half, wasn't it? Or something, 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 something. Well, yeah, really and Lincoln. Well. I think the crowd was what about five four at home to Lincoln, and they bought six hundred. So then you're only looking at four thousand six hundred Gillingham fans, and then Morecambe bought about a hundred out of three eight. So suddenly you've lost all, up nearly a thousand Gills fans in the space of, of two home games after we've not been for eighteen months. That's massively concerning. It's frustrating in the sense of, you know, and he's always recognised this, by the way, but we're the biggest, we're, we're the only league club in Kent, albeit there are others, you know, you know, uh, biting at our, our, our heels, if you will. Um, but we're in a conurbation of Medway of 300,000 people. Kent's got a couple of million. And I, I realise London's around the corner. You know, it's not going to be easy to get people, you know, to support um, support the team. But... We, we should be doing more to attract fans. And, and if anything, he's, he's driving loyal ones away with what he's doing. Uh, the, attracting new ones is, is completely not happening. It, that, that's just not happening at all when it should be. And we're actually lo- we're hemorrhaging fans because of him. Yeah, I can't disagree at the moment, unfortunately, when it should have been, like I've said, it all harks back to the fact that we've all missed it for 18 months. We should be going in and there should be more people coming. We should have all missed it that much that there should be this excitement surrounding going back into the stadium and watching our football club. And it's gone completely the other way after five weeks down, of the season. I think deep down Evans would agree as well, because I think, I think if you if you listen to his comments last week, they're very much in the, in the ilk that we are, but he's had to then come out, you know, with, 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 it seems like a gun to his back. You yeah, know, with, because with he's employed. We can day. say what we want because we're not... Uh, Mr Scully don't pay our wages at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think I think deep down he probably agrees and, and and it'd be interesting the day he leaves to to see what the what his opinion of, of him is, if he ever did come out with it. And, you know, it, 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 I've said to you before, Matt, you know, it takes some doing for the, for, you know, I was pretty anti Evans when he came in. Don't, I don't particularly like him as a person, but he's a, he's a very good manager at this level. And I feel sorry for him as do others. And yeah. there's only one person responsible for that. And that is quite a damning feat that most people that were staunch anti Evans now feel sorry for him. Yep. Yeah. I think mean, that's probably a good place to end it, Reese. unless you've got anything else quickly to sum up. No, uh, no just on the, the talk of a, sort of attracting new fans and, and trying to keep current ones, I think that's where he's made another boo-boo with it's all well and good bringing in this new modern-day ticket system, which, you know, a lot of us have called for for a number of years. So I've not got a problem with that. It's the removal of all the ticket office staff and the, and the ticket office on match day that he now, rem- he now adds a barrier to people that, you know maybe a working late on a Saturday and all of a sudden finish at half one and go, I want to go to the football. They can't just go turn up and pay on the gate anymore, turn up and buy a ticket or older fans that maybe aren't as up to date with technology. I just think he's, yes, moving to the new era of technology, but he also has to have a crossover period, at least for sort of six months a year of keeping the old system in place. Otherwise you're just going to put more people off. And I've read stories of people trying to buy tickets and, and giving up because they can't get to grips with the system. And, Unfortunately, that's, I think that's a problem that's going to persist for a few more months yet. No, I agree. And then you look at merchandise, the kit's not for sale. I want to buy my newborn child, the kit, can't do it. But, you know, there's, there's, there's food and drink outlets not open around the ground, including the factory, which was out of his control. But just it, it just seems, you know, we've lost probably quite a lot of money throughout this pandemic. We've, we've got to pay a loan back. Uh, and yet he's not helping himself in terms of, you know, putting the Whitney Houston Tribute Act aside, actually getting money through the door on match days as well. So it's all very strange. There was a, there was a fellow I know who's very much scally in, it must be said, who didn't buy a Cheltenham ticket because of the ticket system. So I sell a software system as a job. Probably should have tested it before we put it in, probably given a bit more of a period of implementation. And I agree we should have ran both systems at the same time and maybe even do that forever because there's some older people, like Reese says, that are never going to want to touch that. No, you're spot on. Maybe he made all his money on the out-of-date beer. We never know. (laughs) Right. 
Let's leave it there. It's been really interesting. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Reese. I've really enjoyed this as a first episode. So fingers crossed people will watch it, people enjoy it, and then people will be encouraged to get involved in future episodes. Right, everybody, thanks for watching and thanks for listening to this pilot episode. Please leave your comments down below and let us know what you think on anything that we've discussed, on the standard guests, on the standard of presenting. Um, and you know where we are. We're on YouTube, obviously. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter. I'll uh, be back next week to do a match preview ahead of Burton Albion. But until next time, enjoy your weekend and up the jills.